so in the interest of time, we probably need to get started because I know everyone needs to be here trying to work, wait for other members of the committee, uh, but certainly um, we should move forward. Uh, again, good morning. I'm Council Member Idenique Miller. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Uh, joined by my colleague, uh, Council Member Danny Drum, who is the Chair of Education. Uh, today we are here to examine some topics of the labor movement here in New York City after President 45 and and we will be discussing two preconsidered resolutions. The first affirms New York City's right to collective bargaining, and the second is against federal legislation making right to work permanent across the country. There have also, there's also already been proposed cuts to Department of Labor and changes to the work, worker safety regulations, which for decades have protected some of our country's most vulnerable residents. There is no doubt New York City is a union city and New York State is a union state. The right to collect the bargain is written in the Constitution. We have one of the highest densities of union membership in the country and in the budget that was just passed in Albany. Union dues were made tax deductible. Here in New York City, we have also made great strides supporting working families by Working with our brothers and sisters in the movement, we have enacted paid sick, family leave, protected workers in the supermarket, buildings, industries, and increased minimum wage. But these new challenges require more actions, new policies, and will protect workers and progress that we have made. The administration has proposed 21% cuts to Department of Labor, whose goal is to force to promote and develop the welfare wages and earnings of job seekers, retirees in the United States, improving working conditions, advancing opportunities for profitable employment, and assure work-related benefits and rights. While our economy may be strong place in place, we know that not everyone is benefiting from these. Rules and regulations which the Labor Department enforce are meant to ensure equal opportunities and protections for all workers. A major part of proposed cuts are for the Workforce Development Program, which have been given residents new skills that often allow them to enter back into the workforce with rewarding new career opportunities. These include senior community services employment programs, which is proposed to be cut by $434 million, and an additional $11 million would be cut from supposedly unproven occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. At a time when city has seen an increase in deaths in construction industry and other workers, this is abomination. But we have already seen a reversal of some of these policies, including an announcement of OSHA by OSHA. They will delay the regulating crystalline silica, a substance to, known to cause cancer on construction sites. A signed executive order revising the fiduciary rule, which ensures financial advisors have no conflict of interest when advising their business clients, employees, pensions. And, an, and another executive order that mandates each agency take into account the course of regulations instead of the consequences of the workers. As someone who has spent a great portion of my life in the labor movement, I know the impact of collective bargaining and that what it can have on families, quality of life, and how it has enriched our city. The labor history here in New York City must be preserved, but also be an example to others in the state and throughout the country and to our constituency to reduce the, in the inequalities in the communities through collective bargaining and organizing. I'm looking forward to hearing from the representatives of the de Blasio administration unions and experts and advocates who can give us some insight on what can be expected going forward as these new regulations are enacted or attempted to be enacted. Um, we will continue to fight to counter the diminishing power of labor and what we can do here in the city to protect working families. 
I'd like to thank uh, our legislative, <coughs> excuse me, council, Matt Carlin, legislative policy analyst, uh, Gofar Zoloff, and the economist, Kendall. Kendall Stevenson, and everyone uh, who will be testifying here in advance. We've been joined, as I said, by council member Danny Drum. And uh, with that, I'd like to call our first panel. And our first panel is already seated and ready to go. That is excellent. So we have uh, from the mayor's office, Chris Neal, and uh, the deputy commissioner, Liz Vlock. Before you get started, Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. May I begin? Uh, good morning, Chairman Miller, Council Member Drum. Um, I am Chris Neal, Director of the New York City Workforce Development Board. The New York City Workforce Development Board is a federally mandated board whose members are appointed by the mayor. I am staff to the board. I'm also a part of the New York City Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, an office established by the mayor to serve as the coordinating entity for workforce initiatives. I work closely with a number of city agencies, including the Department for the Aging, the Department of Small Business Services, and the Department of Youth and Community Development. Several colleagues from these agencies are present today and will be available for Q&A. I'm also joined today by my colleague from the Department of Consumer Affairs, Liz Vladek, Deputy Commissioner, Office of the Labor, Labor Policy and Standards, who will speak later to worker protection and labor union issues under the Trump administration. Thank you for inviting us to testify here today. The primary focus of my testimony will be to describe several training and employment programs funded by the U.S. Department of Labor, USDOL for short, that benefit New Yorkers, which could be at grave risk due to the Trump administration's proposal to cut the U.S. Department of Labor's overall budget by 21%. USDOL funds a number of programs nationally that help individuals prepare for and connect to jobs. The city of New York received nearly $70 million in total this year from USDOL for employment programs serving three groups of New Yorkers, youth, adults, and seniors. As you are well aware, the Trump administration proposed its skinny budget on March 16th, which included a proposed cut to USDOL funding overall of 21%. But there is a lot of uncertainty about what ultimately will be in the federal budget. Nonetheless, the mayor plans to fight these proposed cuts, which would unfairly target our fellow New Yorkers, many of them low income. I'm going to start by describing employment programs for youth. The city of New York received more than $24 million this year from USDOL for two youth employment programs, the in-school youth and out-of-school youth programs. Both programs are funded by the Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and managed by the Department of Youth and Community Development. The in-school youth program provides year-round services to high school seniors and juniors who meet certain eligibility requirements. In-school youth services are provided by community-based organizations in all five boroughs of the city. What these programs do is really to help young people graduate from high school, pursue college education, and develop their career goals. Services they have access to include counseling, tutoring, leadership activities, a guaranteed paid summer work experience, and others. The out-of-school youth program is a year-long program for youth between the ages of 16 and 24 who are not working and not in school. These disconnected young people upgrade their job skills and find permanent work. The program offers occupational skills training in many different industries, including construction, food service, health care, and retail. The program also provides high school equivalency preparation and support services and aims ultimately to connect these young adults to college or to a job. Participants also receive 12 months of follow-up services after completing the program. Out-of-school youth programs are operated by community-based organizations in all five boroughs of the city. And the WIOA law recognizes the importance of serving disconnected youth. It, it requires that at least 75% of all program funds for youth be spent on out-of-school youth. 
Together, these two USDOL-funded programs will enroll and serve more than 2,600 young adults this year. They will positively impact the lives of young students, of, of young adults like Jessica Piccanini. Jessica enrolled in an out-of-school youth program on a track to earn a Microsoft Office User Specialist Certification. She was shy around her peers in the program, but loved writing and really blossomed in a work readiness session in which the participants wrote a job description for themselves. But she struggled with the certification exam, failing it three times. But she kept at it and finally passed. And she landed her first job as a customer service representative at Stop and Shop, earning 11 bucks an hour, and is able to apply a number of the skills she learned in, during her training program. Cuts to these programs would impact disconnected youth the most and mean that some youth like Jessica could lose the opportunity to build their confidence and find a job. We don't yet know what level of funding USDOL youth programs will have in the federal budget, but regardless of what happens, the de Blasio administration is unwavering in its commitment to continue to build on our progress serving young people and families. And with the strong support of the council, over the past few years, practically every single program area that DYCD operates, from Compass and schools at NYC, after school programs, to the Beacon and Cornerstone community centers, the Summer Youth Employment Program, and Runaway and Homeless Youth Shelter Beds, have all seen increased investment under Mayor de Blasio. I'm now gonna talk about employment programs for adults. The city of New York received more than $41 million this year from the U.S. Department of Labor for adult employment programs, funded by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and managed by Small Business Services. SBS uses WIOA funds for two main purposes, training New Yorkers and connecting them to jobs. SBS invests WIOA funding in training programs that align with employers' needs and help New Yorkers to enter and advance in sectors driving New York City's economy. These include sectors like healthcare, industrial manufacturing, construction, food service and hospitality, tech, and media and entertainment. The Workforce One Career Centers annually connect more than 4,000 New Yorkers to training like these. SBS also operates a network of 20 Workforce One Career Centers throughout the five boroughs with WIOA funding. These centers provide recruitment services for New York City employers and also connect job seekers 18 years of age or older to available employment opportunities. Supporting the mayor's focus on quality jobs, Workforce One connects New Yorkers to employment opportunities in fast growing industries with real opportunities for advancement. The Workforce One centers utilize recruitment expertise, industry knowledge, and skill building workshops to match qualified candidates to positions with their employer partners. And annually, the Workforce One Career Centers connect 25,000 New Yorkers to jobs. Earlier this year, the Workforce One Healthcare Career Center, a specialized center with industry expertise in healthcare, worked closely with the Center's Plan for Healthy Living, which is the second largest managed long-term care provider in New York State. This employer was facing severe challenges finding appropriately qualified registered nurses, but the healthcare center successfully sourced, screened, and referred a number of qualified registered nurses to the employer. The result was phenomenal. 21 individuals got hired over the course of just one month as registered nurses. They earned between $74,000 and $86,000 a year. And moreover, the employer was thrilled to fill so many of these hard to fill positions so quickly. Again, we cannot be certain how USDOL adult employment programs will be funded in the federal budget, but any cuts to their funding would mean fewer New York City job seekers and employers able to share in the success of recruitment efforts like registered nurses hired by the Center's Plan for Healthy Living. I'm now gonna talk about employment programs for seniors. The City of New York received more than $4.3 million from the U.S. Department of Labor this year to support the senior Community Service Employment Program, CSEP for short, managed by the Department for the Aging. The Trump administration's budget proposes to eliminate CSEP entirely. CSEP is an employment and training program targeted to low-income seniors aged 55 or older. This year, DIFTA has served nearly 500 seniors through the program. A major component of CSEP is paid community service. The participants offer their talents to organizations like senior centers, city agencies, and community-based organizations. The ultimate goal is to prepare seniors for jobs. When they transition to full-time jobs, participants earn an average of $14 an hour in a variety of positions, such as certified nursing assistant, customer service representative, bookkeeper, and manager. 
CSEP makes a powerful impact in New York City on the lives of seniors like Jose Roman. At age 60, Jose found himself with bills mounting and under incredible pressure to find a job. He enrolled in the CSEP program and found a highly supportive staff at DIFTA. Jose didn't want just a job. He wanted an opportunity in which he could really grow professionally. However, he went on interview after interview without a callback, facing intense disappointment, but the DIFTA staff helped him. They helped him hone his interview skills, which ultimately helped him land a position as a patient navigator at Urban Health Plan in the South Bronx. He is now earning nearly $18 an hour and will have access to great benefits, including health insurance, vacation days, a 401k, and others once he passes his probationary period in May. DIFTA has served older adults through CSEP for more than 25 years. The program remains critically important because older New Yorkers are living longer than ever before, and many turn to DIFTA to, for help to secure a continuing role in the workforce. Low-income seniors rely on the program for training income and help finding a job. The program is a lifeline for participants because it helps them cover their living expenses, like food and housing. That support, in turn, protects seniors against more serious issues like food insecurity, rent arrears, and homelessness. The program helps seniors stay economically viable in this expensive city. They're relying on CSEP to gain employment and to survive, and without CSEP, seniors like Jose Roman would not have the support. As I've described, the Trump administration's budget proposes cuts that could impact critical employment programs in our city. But the de Blasio administration plans to fight these cuts that would put everyday New Yorkers, youth, adults, and seniors in the crosshairs, depriving them of valuable programs that would help them prepare for and connect to a job to support their families. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Miller and members Drum and Lander and Council for the opportunity to offer testimony today. Our mayor, the speaker, and all of you have shown great leadership in pursuing policies and laws that ensure workers in New York City, particularly the most vulnerable, can care for themselves and their families. Through the collaborative efforts of the administration and the council, the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Labor Policy and Standards, which I direct in my role as DCA Deputy Commissioner, has been established as a dedicated voice in city government for workers in New York City. Together, we have demonstrated the city's commitment to building on its historic role of serving as a laboratory for new progressive policies. OLPS takes very seriously our mandate to enforce key workplace laws and rules, to educate workers, employers, and the public about local, state, and federal workplace protections, and to conduct original research and use it to advance new policy initiatives that are responsive to a changing economy. I'm glad to be on this panel this morning with Director Neal, who has spoken so powerfully about potential problems under um, the Trump administration's proposed skinny budget. I also want to acknowledge the work of our colleagues at the Office of Labor Relations, which of course represents the mayor in the conduct of labor relations between the city of New York and the labor unions representing city employees. Under Mayor de Blasio, the city's commitment to collective bargaining with its own workforce has never been stronger. According to OLR, 90% of city employees are represented by a union. That's a total of 337,000 employees and 144 bargaining units. When the mayor took office, every city collective bargaining agreement was expired. This administration has since entered into agreements covering 99.57% of the city's represented workforce, and it's on track to achieve $3.4 billion in a landmark labor management health savings agreement that made the first significant changes to the health plan since 1982. The administration's achievements include negotiating nine uh, in negotiating nine-year collective bargaining agreements, or CBAs, for more than 140,000 employees who hadn't received any wage increases since 2008, and seven-year CBAs for most of the more than 200,000 employees who hadn't received any wage increases since 2010. 
More than 100 CBAs were overwhelmingly ratified by union membership and hailed as fiscally responsible by the city's fiscal monitors. Further, the city has worked with our unions to establish wellness programs, joint funds for child and elder care programs, and to create additional education, education and training opportunities for early education workers. My colleague Renee Campion and her, um, her colleagues are here from OLR if you have further questions about these points. But they are all examples of policies that we in New York City know are critical to protect working families and grow our economy. In contrast to these forward-looking policies, I would like to note some of our concerns about how new federal government priorities could negatively impact enforcement of important workers' rights laws, and, dis and I would like to discuss the threat posed by right-to-work legislation pending in Congress. I know that obviously we have heard Director Neal speak about the, how the President's proposed budget could negatively impact workers and their families. In addition to slashing resources, there are many ways that the federal administration could hurt workers when it comes to critical workplace standards. The Trump administration's actions on immigration have already had a terrible impact on immigrant workers in our communities. Other harmful actions that the executive branch could pursue unilaterally include decreased enforcement dollars devoted to police wage and hour and health and safety violations, changing priorities that shift enforcement efforts away from vulnerable workforces where violations can multiply, the recent rollback of the Fair Pay and Safe Workplaces Executive Order, EO 13673, that had previously made it more difficult for habitual labor and employment law violators to get federal contracts, and appointments to key leadership roles of individuals with anti-worker and anti-labor agendas. Though organizing by stakeholders, including some in this room in the city, um, on all around the country, defeated the administration's first nominee for Labor Secretary, Andrew Puzder, there are still numerous critical positions left to fill. Additionally, problematic legislative initiatives, such as the proposed repeal of the federal Davis-Bacon Act, which requires payment of a prevailing wage on federally funded public works projects, could also pose serious harm to workers and their families. Other legislation of concern, which I would like to focus my attention on now, is a pending National Right to Work Act, right to work Act which would undermine unions' ability to organize around the country. Under current federal law, Unions representing private sector workers must represent all of an employer's employees. But many state right to work laws, I think we're up to about 27, 27 states, allow workers not to pay dues to the union, even though the union must still represent them. This is known as a free rider problem. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had this to say about right to work laws all the way back in 1961. He said, in our glorious fight for civil rights, we must guard against being fooled by false slogans such as right to work. It is a law to rob us of our civil rights and job rights. Its purpose is to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining by which unions have improved wages and working conditions of everyone. Wherever these laws have been passed, Wages are lower, job opportunities are fewer, and there are no civil rights. In other words, and despite its misleading shorthand, right-to-work legislation does nothing to enhance the rights of workers. Instead, a 2015 study by the Economic Policy Institute, or EPI, found that wages in right-to-work states are 3.1 percent lower than those in non-right-to-work states, meaning that, on average, full-time salary workers were earning $1,558 less per year in right-to-work states compared to other states. A 2011 EPA study found that the rate of employer-sponsored health insurance is 2.6 percent lower and the rate of employer-sponsored pensions 4.8 percent lower in right-to-work states. If we extrapolated these conditions nationally, that would be 2 million fewer workers that would have employer-sponsored health insurance and 3.8 million fewer workers that would have employer-sponsored pensions. It is clear that right-to-work laws undermine unions. Union membership has fallen by 40 percent in Wisconsin since 2002, following the passage of right-to-work laws and other anti-union laws there. 
Weakening unions threatens workers' incomes, as unionization typically raises wages and improves working conditions. A 2012 EPI study determined that union membership raises compensation of union workers by 13.6%. Unions also benefit women and workers of color. Female union members are paid over 30% more than female workers who are not members of a union. The pay gap is smaller between men and women in unions than it is between men and women who are not in unions. Workers of color dis benefit disproportionately from union representation as well. When compared to their counterparts who are not in unions, black workers receive 17.3% more in wages, Hispanic workers receive 23.1% more, and Asian workers receive 14.7% more. Right to work laws chip away at all of these benefits for workers. An argument that we often hear in support of right to work laws is that they bolster employment, competition, and wages. But numerous rigorous studies have found that this is, in fact, not the case. These studies have shown that right to work laws do little to boost employment rates or attract high, higher wage manufacturing jobs. Studies and surveys of the manufacturing industry, for example, do not indicate that having right to work laws is a factor in location decisions. Instead, there's evidence that higher wage, higher tech manufacturers are drawn to states with strong education systems, along uh, strong research universities, good digital infrastructure, and other features. Higher wages, infrastructure, strong education, these are all among New York City's economic commitments under Mayor de Blasio. Our administration views collaborative relationships with business and labor as critical to sustained, equitable economic growth. That is why, both in the city's relationship to its own workforce and in terms of general minimum labor standards, we have pursued policies that make New York City a leading example of progressive and innovative legislation and other initiatives that benefit working people and strengthen the economy. Unions were major proponents of the New York City paid sick time law, which OLPS enforces and which has had a major positive impact on working conditions for non-union and union workers alike. Labor unions have also advocated for increases in the state minimum wage and for the mayor's groundbreaking proposed fair work week legislation, which, as you know, the administration is working hard with the council to move forward. At OLPS, we know that unions help provide important protections from filing complaints on behalf of aggrieved workers to helping identify problem industries. Because we know that unionization results in important benefits and protections for workers, we oppose attacks on unions and threats to workers' ability to organize, such as the false slogan of right to work. Under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, we are proud of the city's record pursuing policies that improve conditions for and empower working people and the organizations that represent them. And if I may just add to my written testimony, um, I want to make sure everyone here is aware that this coming Tuesday, April 25th, um, our agency, the, de the uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, is co-convening a hearing on the state of workers' rights in New York City together with Moya and the Commission on Human Rights. Um, we are inviting workers and their representations, organizations that look at workers' rights issues to come and testify, submit testimony, um, in order to help us address um, some of the issues that are coming up under the new federal administration. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that detailed testimony. Glad to see that so much work is being done. I'm gonna have a few questions for you as well, but I wanna start with Mr. Neal. And, um, and let them talk a little, in a little more detail about the impact on the workforce development that these budget cuts, uh, these cuts may have, uh, in particular to um, what does the uh, current demographics of those that you are serving look like, um, and what would be the impact of, uh, the, the most immediate impact of some of the, the, the services that would not be delivered if, in fact, um, these loss of funds it come to fruition. Okay. <clears throat> um, I will uh, start by talking about the um, the uh, Workforce One Career Centers. Um, you know, these these centers serve individuals who are 18 years of age or older. I know that the majority of folks come in, um, you know, unemployed. That's the vast majority of folks coming in unemployed. 
Um, to talk about the impact, it's, it's hard right now, right? 21% across the board. We don't know what that means for individual programs like the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. There's so much in flux. You have, you know, Republican senators like Lindsey Graham saying the budget is dead on arrival. So we, the situation is extremely fluid, and we think we'll know a little bit more in late May once the agencies have proposed their, uh, their full budgets. But right now, all we have is this 21% number, and, and so it's very hard to really forecast with any certainty um, what those cuts will look like. We know it'll hurt New Yorkers. We know it'll hurt working families. Um, we just don't know how deeply, and so it's, it is a bit speculative at this point. We'll know more, like I said, probably in a, in a month, month and a half. So in, in terms of uh, the senior programming that you have, is the, it, could you be a little more concrete with that? Is there any one of the, the three categories that you define in, in your testimony that you can say as a matter of fact that you know that will be impacted, or at least maybe not to what degree, but certainly that any loss of, uh, of funding would, would impact, have a great impact? Well, I mean, programs? Any, any cuts to any of these programs would, would have an impact. It would mean that we probably would be able not, you know, we'd have to serve fewer youth, adults, or seniors. I mean, I think the, the scariest of the three is uh, CSEP, the, the, the Senior Employment Program, which the Trump administration has graciously proposed to eliminate. Um, but this is a program that serves 500 seniors every year. It's a vital program to low-income seniors who want to continue working. They need help. They need support. Uh, and it helps them, you know, pay for food, pay for housing. Uh, that's the one that I think is, is, is the most serious. But we don't know if that's going to happen. We don't know if there could be a large cut. There could be a small cut. Um, I think a lot depends on how well we can work with members of Congress and other governors and mayors across the country um, to make sure that we're fighting these cuts and to make sure that if there are cuts, they're as small as possible. Um, right now, um, what percentage of these total percentage of, of the budgets of these programs come from the federal government? Um, so for the, um, for the out of school and in school youth program, my, my colleagues from the UICD can correct me, but I believe the vast majority is from the, the federal government from the U.S. Department of Labor for those two programs. It's 100%, okay, and it was close to 100%. Um, for the CSEP program, it is also 100% from the U.S. Department of Labor, so completely federally funded. For the Workforce One Career Centers, it's certainly the majority, but it's not the only source of funding. There are other sources of funding that help um, support both the employment centers and the training programs that SBS runs. So it's, it's, it's a majority, but it's not 100%. Okay, before, uh, let me just say that we've been joined by council members Robert Cornegy, Elizabeth Crowley, and Costa Costa-Tanides as well, and we will certainly take questions from them momentarily. Um, so uh, apparently that this would have a great uh, impact on workforce development here in the city um, if these cuts were to come to fruition. Um, I'm, I'm, and I, I know that there are some questions that we've put our head together around what would be other sources, but we do have our small business uh, chair here, and I'm going to let him ask those questions as well. Um, so, on, and I'll come back. And, oh, sure. And, and I'm sure the entire panel uh, or, or the uh, co my colleagues have questions as well, so I want to kind of jump over to the commissioner and uh, talk about policy here and, and some of the things that have been proposed that you may want to drill down on, some of the things that you think would have the greatest impact in terms of public policy uh, that are being offered up uh, from D.C. And you spoke uh, very eloquently about right to work, um, certainly uh, right to organize and, and some of the affronts that we've seen on uh, worker safety uh, certainly something that we should be taking a look at as well. Could you elaborate on, on that, please? Certainly. Um, so we know that the administration is looking at um, rolling back some protections under OSHA. We know that there is consideration of 
Um, I think it's a rule that would, uh, of rolling back a rule that would require certain kinds of reporting of incidents, that's worrisome. Um, you know, the points that I mentioned in my testimony, I mean, obviously rolling back Davis-Bacon, um, I mean, I think we all, I, I don't have any statistics at my fingertips, I can certainly um, provide some uh, at a later time, but obviously we know that, you know, prevailing wages are an incredibly important part of, you know, making construction industry jobs good jobs. The federal government is a major source of employment. Um, I, yes. I know you discussed, uh, you mentioned the upcoming hearing uh, that would, would, would kind of uh, addressing, would, would you be addressing some of the concerns that are being brought up here at this hearing today and how we may kind of create uh, mechanisms to deter this, how we build coalitions uh, that fight this off. So um, certainly, you know, we, we would like you to talk about that, but what industry would you see here within the city that would be most impacted if in fact uh, we saw the changes in some of these regulations? Well, I think, you know, one of the concerning things is that when you look at the, the menu of items that seems to be, seem to be under consideration in D.C., it's hard to identify an industry that would totally escape some impact, um, which is part of why the hearing that we have noticed for this coming Tuesday has a broad topic. Um, why we have been working to get the notice out far and wide to, you know, as many stakeholders as we can because we want to hear from workers and from their organizations about their particular views of, of what seems to be coming down the pike and what workers are experiencing, you know, on the, at the workplace today. And I think we're hoping that that is a record that will help us to further shape and develop new policies. I mean, as you know, we are hard at work on um, our paid sick leave law implementation, which is only two and a half years old, we think of it as like it's been around forever. The oldest paid sick leave law in the country is only 10 years old. Um, we have fair work week scheduling legislation that is pending, hopefully, on a track to be passed sooner rather than later. And my office will soon begin enforcing a new law, the Freelances and Free Act, to address wage theft problems among a whole group of workers that you know, hasn't been covered by labor protections historically. So there's a lot to be done, um, but, you know, we have a lot of appetite and certainly a mandate to, to push forward. So do, would you consider that, do you think that these recent policies and some of the policies and protections that we put in place here for workers in the city of New York are, are in jeopardy because of this? And if so, how would we address that? So I think as significant as our concerns are about the immediate moment that we're in, um, the reality is that workers have been facing serious problems for far long, since long before November of 2016. Um, and so the, the foresight of the council and the administration in creating our office and passing new municipal labor standards is really about making a statement that the city, that cities, right, not only ours, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago's now wants to set up an office modeled on ours, um, because cities are really trying to take more of an initiative to impact working conditions in areas that for a long time people just sort of gave up on because they thought, well, this is really the feds or this is really the state. And I think more and more we're, we're finding creative and innovative ways to stake out space for cities and for our city um, to, to push, you know, to push for new standards, which frankly is a role that we've played historically. Right? We know that many of the first health and safety provisions and wage provisions came out of you know, F workers mobilizing to change conditions in New York City a hundred years ago. Um, so what's old is new, I guess. But, you know, I'm excited about the work that we're doing, and I think there is a lot we can do and that we are doing locally. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take some, uh, we're going to hit some questions from my colleagues now. We're going to begin with uh, Council Member Crowley. Thank you, Chair Miller. Thank you for having this important meeting, hearing, rather. Um, I have a question as it relates to the infrastructure projects. I'd read in the newspaper that uh, there was some comment that the um, that Trump made that uh, said that he would he may be looking to remove uh, prevailing wage laws. Uh, do you know of anything like that? 
Um, I don't I don't know the specific comment. I don't know if it, if possibly that that could be related to um, an initiative to repeal Davis Bacon, um, if the Davis Bacon law, which so who's carrying the initiative and has do you know if. Uh the legislation has been introduced in the, I think, in both houses. Um, I'm happy to follow up with with your office and and send the draft legislation. But when he made an announcement, I think yesterday or the day before about uh, the visas, he didn't address that issue. Did I you know? I don't yeah. believe so, but I'm happy to follow up. Oh, okay. Because I think that the article was really like that. They had thought that he was going to say something about that. Uh, do, do we have any idea when we'll know uh, the, the level of proposed cuts, what the reality? Um, I can only speak for myself personally. I, I certainly wouldn't be placing any bets on, you know, the planfulness and organization of the current administration in D.C. So when is the budget finalized? The federal budget. budget? Yeah. Yeah, I believe it's the next few months. I think it's supposed to be ready for October 1st for the new federal fiscal year. And when, when do they vote on it? Uh, when, the, when they have a bill that, that they've worked through that they can agree on. I mean, traditionally. It, it, sorry? Do you know traditionally? I don't, I don't know traditionally. That's it. No other questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilman McCormick. So I'll keep my uh, questions specifically around the workforce uh, development piece. As the Chair of Small Business, um, we've watched some of those programs be essential in filling jobs, especially in and around the, the retail sector. Um, I just want to know <laughs> What, what kind of damage, I'm going to be blunt, what kind of damage could potentially these cuts do to workforce development in, in the city? Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know how bad the cuts are going to be yet, right? And there's a lot that's going to play out and change, and we're hoping that we can fight that. If it's 21%, it, it, that's a lot of New Yorkers and working families that would get hurt. Um, you know, there's, there's no way around that. But our hope is that we will see those cuts get trimmed down to a much smaller amount than they're currently proposed at. Um, one of my concerns, as I mentioned earlier, is the CSEP program, the, the Senior Employment Program, because it is, it is straight in the crosshairs to be completely eliminated. Um, is that going to happen? We don't know. Um, would that have a major impact on seniors in New York? Absolutely. The 500 seniors a year who benefit from those services as a, as a real lifeline to affording rent and food uh, would be in jeopardy. Um, so, you know, we, we will know a lot more, I think, once the, the individual federal agencies submit their full budgets because it's a 21 percent cut for the U.S. Department of Labor, but we don't know exactly where that's going to come from, how much is going to come from the um, you know, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funding, how much is going to come from worker protection, how much is going to come from OSHA. We, we don't know. So at this point, it is a lot of speculation, but at the end of the day, any cuts would, would hurt working New Yorkers and their families. So, so from an overall perspective, I've been, I've been relatively happy with the, the administration's commitment to workforce development through the programs. Um, I'm concerned that not intentionally, but the cuts will change the vision of what the city has put, you know, you know what I mean? So, so we could, so, so cuts for the sake of cuts are what they are, right? We have generally no control over that. What I'm concerned with is when, if and when these cuts do come down, will it change the city's trajectory in and around workforce development? No. Um, and I can say that uh, definitively because the city has a very strong vision for workforce development. Um, our office released the Career Pathways Report back in 2014. Um, we're working with city agencies closely. The, you know, um, the Department of Youth and Community Developments, uh, out-of-school youth and in-school youth program are now focused a lot more on occupational skills training. Uh, there's a lot of investment that SBS is doing in 
uh, in training and in demand areas. And so, you know, cuts would hurt. But we, this is the vision. And, and all agencies have really bought onto this because it's the right thing to do for New Yorkers. It's not just about jobs. It's about preparing New Yorkers for careers. It's about preparing them for careers that can support a family, frankly. Uh, and we are making the investments citywide, and this is not the only pot of funds that we have. We are making investments citywide in education and training and employment. So would cuts hurt? Absolutely, but it's, it's not going to throw us off the course. It's not going to change our vision. We're, we're going to continue to do things like we're doing now. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm wondering, anecdotally, I feel like there's a, a, a this is anecdotal, that there's a high percentage of uh, participants who go through the workforce development who wind up in small businesses. Do you have supporting data uh, to, to, does your data support my anecdotal assertion that, that there's, a, there's a, a large number of individuals who go through uh, the workforce development programs and um, end up in small businesses in the city? I, I, I don't know the answer, the answer to that. I'll look at my colleague from Small Business Services. Good morning, I'm Melanie Hart, Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development. How are you? I'm sorry, so I just want to make sure I understand the question you're asking. You're saying that people who are going through workforce development are end up working at small businesses? Is that the question? So I don't have... If you know, mm -hmm. uh, what is the percentage? I, anecdotally, I, think, I feel like it's a high percentage based on my, my involvement and relationship to the workforce development centers around the city mm -hmm. and my involvement and relationship to small businesses. I feel like that, that's creating a pathway. I just want to know if there's sub substantiating data to that effect or not. So we can, I can get that number for you so it can be more specific. Um, I also want to specifically ask the question of what are you considering a small business because we're talking, I know different standards are used when we talk about the number, the size. Are we talking under 100 employees just to make sure I'm answering the so question? So yeah, we could use the state's definition of under 100 okay. employees, but, but I break it down to you know small, uh, medium, and then there's micro businesses, right? So, Indeed. so we understand that you know the largest no number of businesses, to my understanding, are between one and five in districts like mine. Exactly. That's the that's the workforce. Exactly. Um, also, I'm astutely aware that there is a statistic, and I forget where it comes from, that says if we could build capacity in small businesses in the city of New York to hire one more person, mm -hmm. we could decrease unemployment by 50 percent very quickly. Yeah. Right, so that's been my mission. Like, so I don't have this great philosophical mission. It's to, to help build capacity. And when I see things like this, who potentially would provide barriers to doing exactly that, I, I get nervous. So my line of questioning is based around uh, uh, a statistic mm -hmm. that I felt like the city was supporting a movement towards with its workforce development programs. Potentially, a cut could change that whole that whole trajectory, and which is what none of us want to see. Indeed. And so I will make sure, one, to make sure we get a specific number to you of what the breakdown is in, in terms of where people are falling out and once they're employed. But I think your larger question is also about how are we making sure that on the business side that we're continuing to support those small businesses and, and SBS maintains its commitment to working with small businesses throughout the city through both the workforce development side as well as our other sides of the house, which are MWBE, as well as all of our business services. So that work is intent, we intend for that work to also continue as a whole. And, and so that's the scary thing for me is like we've, we've come so far over a short period of time with a commitment from the administration to do that. Yes. And what, what I've seen happen in government is that when the funding isn't there, we abandon the whole mission. Not intentionally, but because money is what it is. I, I, I want to I wanna ensure that no matter what happens, that, that level of commitment or Indeed. the degree of commitment remains the same. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And we can also get you the, the figures from DYCD and uh, DIFTA in terms of the number of small businesses where folks get their jobs. Yeah, so, f so for me, it helps me work with the chair to articulate a narrative that we got to send up the food chain about why it's so important from my perspective for, for these cuts not to happen. And, and that supporting data would, would, would definitely be essential in doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member John. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my concern is um, related to this topic, but uh, maybe a little bit uh, different, and that is the effect of the Supreme Court, especially with the appointment of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, and uh, how that's going to affect labor laws. I'm thinking of Friedrich and other cases that are pending 
And I think that that's going to have a very negative uh, impact upon all of us should that case proceed. Can you um, address some of those issues uh, as you see them? Uh, certainly. Um, you know, again, obviously, um, Friedrichs had an unexpected outcome um, given the sudden death of Justice Scalia, um, the case deadlocked four to four. Um, this is a case that would have basically made it um, turned most state public sector um, union dues structures into right to work structures. It would have introduced right to work as functionally, it would have introduced right to work into public sector collective bargaining relations, um, which would have, you know, our, our um, projections is that it would have had, had the same kind of devastating impact in the public sector as it's had in the private sector, um, where there are right to work laws on the books. Um, yes, I think there's, you know, a reasonable amount of concern that um, with the new fully constituted Supreme Court, a case that raises similar issues to Friedrichs will make its way back, um, back to the Supreme Court. Obviously, we don't know how any one case will come out. It depends on the facts. We don't, you know, uh, Justice's track record doesn't necessarily tell us where they're going to come out. Um, but it's a matter of serious concern, as are, you know, any number of, of other cases that could make their way up to the Supreme Court and, you know, and impact labor and workers. So there, there was a, um, was it a four to four uh, ruling on that? Now with the addition of Gorsuch, um, do we do we know what his record is uh, in terms of labor laws? Yeah, I mean it's not you know it's it's uh, what the little we know is not very encouraging. Um, we know he's a strict textualist in the mold of Justice Scalia. Um, we know that he tends to in his rulings he tends to come down on the side of the powerful instead of the powerless. Um, we know he had one decision that was very hard to understand involving a trucker who was whose tr you know, truck became disabled and after three hours freezing in his cab with help not arriving, um, the trucker left to get help and was terminated. And Gorsuch found that he should have, that he would have held the termination. So, you know, again, we never know how any judge will rule on any given facts in any given case, but I don't think we're too optimistic. Uh, you know, I was a, a United Federation of Teachers uh, union chapter leader for 20, almost 25 years at the school where I taught before being elected to the council. Another issue of major concern to me is the weakening of tenure laws. Uh, does that come under your purview? Um, it doesn't. So, as you know, um, labor relations, private labor relations are regulated, of course, by the Federal National Labor Relations Act. It's the state um, public employment relations law that regulates those issues in New York, and it's, you know, state laws for the most part that regulate those issues on a state-by-state -state basis. So we're pretty clearly carved out from um, actually directly regulating in the area of collective bargaining. Um, with that said, I do want to point to one of the bills pending um, as part of the Fair Work Week scheduling legislation package. Um, I think it's 1384, um, and I'll double check and correct the record if I'm mistaken, um, which would create a new uh, mandatory obligation for employers to honor uh, requests from workers to remit um, voluntary contributions to organizations of a worker's choice. Um, the mechanism is very similar to a union dues deduction mechanism, and the intent is to enable workers um, to fund and support organizations that they're collaborating with on, you know, making changes in their workplace and their lives. There's no law like this in the country. Um, it's specifically what we've identified. We do think we have some jurisdiction over as a municipality. Um, and if it passes, you know, there's more work to be done on the bill as introduced, but if it passes, I think it really does, you know, open up a, a new possible door for supporting workers. So would those organizations be known as vote, vote, cope type organizations? Is it for political purposes or is it for other purposes? It's not. It's for other purposes. It's voluntary contributions to nonprofit organizations, right? Since we cannot regulate in the area of labor unions, either federal, under federal law in the private sector, under state law for the public sector, it's specifically about nonprofit organizations that are working with um, workers on, you know, whatever issues are, are of concern to them. We're also facing um, some issues around the possibility of a constitutional convention here in New York State, um, which um, actually, you know, protects uh, the Constitution as it is written now, 
protects our pension rights as um, members of unions and um, workforces. Is there any movement on a uh, national level uh, regarding um, the um, weakening of pension um, of pensions? Yeah, so um, I, I would have to follow up with you on, on you know, that question is broadly framed. I know that in particular, we had been hopeful about a new rule that would have permitted municipalities to introduce legislation to require workers to have contributions automatically deducted and remitted to a 401k, trying to look for a new model um, for some kind of a, a standing permanent reliable pension fund for workers. Um, I believe that the Trump administration has closed that, that gap and that now that's a innovation we won't be able to pursue, at least at, at the present time. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Drum. Um, and, and, and that brought up some, some really interesting questions now. And I, and I know the interest, we want to move this thing along, this hearing, but this is um, very important. And we, we have the deputy who's very astute and, and learned it there, and we want to make sure that we uh, really take advantage of this access that we have this morning here. Um, from from an OLR perspective, Office of Labor Relations, and and um, Council Member Drum certainly brought up uh, some of his concerns uh, over at DOE. But there are a number of services that get delivered every day to the citizenry, citizenry of, of 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 New York City here, whether it's in in, in pub, through public education, uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, health and, and human services and, and otherwise. Um, so we want to talk about what impact um, we may see on, on delivery of some of these services. We don't have to get into the specifics of agencies, but I know um, obviously um, there's been some, some uh, a lot of talk and movement around national policing policies, um, uh, uh, not to mention funding the same around public education, health care, and things of that nature there. What could you anticipate or foresee, not just from a, from a funding perspective, but certainly from a policy perspective that may impact us uh, here in the city of New York? Hi, good morning. Um, so my name is Renee Campion. I'm the first deputy commissioner at the New York City Office of Labor Relations. Um, as you're all aware, the New York City Office of Labor Relations under Executive Order 13 is responsible on behalf of the mayor for negotiating city contracts with all of its city um, public sector unions. Um, the commissioner is also responsible for um, uh, acting as liaison on behalf of the mayor in the private sector um, for any issues that, that come up and that, that he is asked to, to uh, participate in. Um, I'm not. I'm having trouble trying to frame your your question and trying to to just focus on it. On, uh, could you clarify so in, outside, in relation to public sector employees? So, so, so outside of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, so from from a funding perspective, obviously um, there may be some 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 federal dollars that that fall within these agencies, obviously. Right? Um, what impact would that have? And then some of the policy that is coming out of uh, number two would be some of the policy that we're seeing uh, and, and uh, uh, through whatever, through executive order or through uh, legislative uh, attempts, what impact would you see, can we see if those came to fruition? Number one, um, the, the, the lack of funding. Number two would be policy and laws coming out. Um, whether or not it was, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, 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 a decree that came out of uh, the federal monitor around stop and frisk, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so um, there's been a lot of conversations with the federal judge and, and, and his team as to what would be the next steps around that. And, and as part of that, there's been negotiations around uh, the, the police and cameras and, and some other things mm -hmm. um, that have gone on through um, negotiations with community of colors and the Black Latino Asian Caucus and other organizations throughout the city. Um, do you foresee some of the, the national policing uh, uh, regulations that that are trying to be implemented having an impact on that. So we would take that as well as what is going on in uh, uh, affordable health care 
and other things uh, are any of these new policies that are being introduced uh, do you f see as a potential uh, negative towards the services being delivered here by these city agencies? So um, let me start with, to the extent that there are reductions in funding overall on a citywide basis as a result of reductions in federal funding or state funding on the city, that would likely have an impact on how we would pursue, uh, we must, collective bargaining in the city of New York is alive and well, I'll start with that. As we're all aware of it, we've reached 199.5% um, of our collective bargaining agreements. We will always b bargain and negotiate with our city unions. Um, if the budget, if the budgets of the various budgets are impacted, we'll have to deal with that as it comes. We'll have to assess that and analyze that. It's hard to, at this juncture, to sort of have a, um, to see exactly what kind of impact that would be. The policies that, if there are policy changes to the extent that they impact mandatory subjects of bargaining that we would, we as the city would need to negotiate with our unions, we will negotiate those as we historically have and will continue to do so. The policies, um, as far as specifically about policing, there have been many discussions that have gone on over the past several years uh, with the police, each, each of the police represented unions involving different issues. Um, and the city has negotiated with them and continues to negotiate with each of them on the issues that impact them. Um, your uh, question regarding DOT, I'm less familiar with. I'm not exact. I'm not 100% sure so, about. So, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, so, so obviously, there's been a lot of chat around infrastructure, mm -hmm. and and so obviously that would impact uh, DOT as well. And I understand a lot of federal dollars are more around equipment than it is around uh, actual operations or manpower. Mm -hmm. But certainly, um, is is something to take a look at mm -hmm. because you can have equipment if you don't have someone to operate that it doesn't really matter. Um, and in a long term uh, macro, do we do we see uh, it having an impact on the diminishing of funds? Again, uh, each and every agency uh, now is not only do they, um, if they are providing funds, they are providing funds with a caveat that they have to be used in a certain way, or they can't be used in a certain way, or they have to be opened up. Um, in particular, we've seen a lot of uh, around the DOT that we have not seen a highway, a highway trust bill for decades, right? But when you see one that has come out of the last Republican Congress, it, it included like 33% privatization. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So certainly that would have a, a real impact on the workforce there. So those are some of the things that we hope that we're, we're paying attention to that we we'll be able to protect or offset and, and whether or not we could move forward um, with some of these projects if they included those type of uh, uh, caveats. Mm -hmm. And certainly it was something that we would not like to see. Are we preparing to move forward mm -hmm. without that? It's the same as, as, as losing services because we have committed ourselves to being and reaffirmed ourselves to being a sanctuary city. And, and, and certainly they've already began to look at the loss of funds because of that. So what impact would that have on the services that are being delivered? In particular, again, that, you know, uh, around public safety, it, that's a big issue as well. I, I think in, in, in someone's comment, uh, it was mentioned about uh, whether or not city agencies are going to uh, work collaboratively to enforce some of those federal regulations. Are the police department going to work with ICE? Are we going the DOE and the other agencies going to uh, provide assistance while they enforce some of those uh, new regulations? So those are some of the things from 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 uh, uh, OOL, OLR perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how do we how do we address that? So, so from OLR's perspective, we would work with each of the individual agencies, any, any agency that is impacted in any way uh, as a result of policy changes, cuts that come from the state or federal level. OLR would work with each, and each individual agency to assess what the impact, if any, there would be, 
on its workers, on its workforce, and we would work together with the unions as well as with the agency to figure out how to, how to proceed and what would be the best way of, of proceeding based on the policy change if, if, that was, if that was to happen. We would be part of that process to the extent it impacted our individual, our you know, public sector workers. You know what, I, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because I know that um, there was a, a directive memorandum that came out from the administration to the DOE and some of his employees as to how, um, how to deal with situations where ICE may uh, go into the building mm -hmm. and, and what that would be. Um, so I would hope that in the future that there is conversations with UFT and, and 94 and, and 32 BJ and, 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 and local 237 and the people that are represented in those school buildings that they are properly equipped and have the resources to be able to address that. So there are certainly unintended consequences to some of these things that we're seeing and we're saying that, you know, if, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it collectively. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really good to hear that uh, certainly not just that we're fighting it or the admin is fighting it, but the people on the ground that are delivering those services really have the type of tools and equipment that they have to continue to provide services and not jeopardize themselves in, in doing so. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, Council Member Drum. Just to reiterate what you're saying, um, you know, I think it's estimated that um, if Betsy DeVos is um, able to concoct her scheme of putting vouchers forward um, and taking away Title I funding from the Department of Education, it would be a cut of about $148 million mm -hmm. to the Department of Education. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you raised that issue and, and, and to caution you, especially as it relates to um, um, when we have to come down, if, should we face a cut like that, the priorities of the administration um, you know, in terms of uh, how we deal with personnel or how we deal with cuts like that moving mm -hmm. forward. So mm -hmm. not something to uh, just, um, you know, laugh at or whatever, you know. Thank you. So, so in, in general, I just ask in the future that, that we bring in those bargaining units that are representing those workers and so forth, that we're, in some cases, we're, we're increasing their responsibilities or altering terms of conditions of, of employment and, uh, forcing you to deal with other agencies in, in, in other ways and while we have the best of intentions we want the best outcomes and, and so so we ask that we uh, make sure that we get every and before we go I have, have uh, uh, this uh, the, the previous uh, Secretary of Labor uh, Perez had outlined a, a strategy and, and plan. He had five specific go goals, including improving workers' safety, securing retirement and health, and, and other benefits. With these regulations, uh, we've already seen them being repealed, obviously. Um, what are we doing to offset that and, and protect some of the the, the, the strides that we have made here in the city? Well, I, you know, when it comes to um, workers' rights standard and protections of labor, um, I think we're doing what we've always been doing. I think we heard very clearly from the Trump campaign what their values were and what their priorities were, and they're following through with their initial policy attempts. We've also been very clear as an administration, the mayor has been clear, the council has been clear about what our priorities are, what our commitments are, what our values are. And we, are, we strive to fulfill those every day with the legislation we are moving forward, new programs, new laws, um, our approaches to enforcement and education. I mean, you know, I think the mayor said very early after um, the election, you know, this doesn't change our values, so we're still who we are. Okay, excellent, and, and I'm, I really appreciate that commitment um, from, from the administration. And, and finally, uh, Mr. Neal, there are actually two programs of all the cuts that were being made uh, within the, de the Department of Labor um, that have been, actually the budgets have been beefed up and, and have, uh, and, and they are state-run apprentice programs as well as reemployment and eligibility assessment programs. Is there a reason 
why those programs uh, have been targeted uh, as uh, something that they want to, the federal government wants to invest additional resources in and what impact would that have on other programs? Well, I, I can only I can only speculate. Um, but the, the reemployment dollars are for workers that have lost their jobs that are dislocated and are trying to get back to work. Um, and so presumably there is some overlap between that strategy and the, the you know, some of the folks in certain parts of the countries that, that voted for, for uh, President Trump. Um, in terms of apprenticeship, I mean, we are supportive of apprenticeship. There are, uh, obviously, there are a ton of apprenticeship programs that are extremely successful in the construction trades. Um, under President Obama, there was a movement towards trying to encourage more non-traditional apprenticeships in areas like healthcare and tech. Um, I, I suspect the uh, Trump administration sees that there's an evidence base there that's worth investing in that might tie to more of the trades, and so they, they may want to invest in that. So again, speculation, but um, I, th I think that's why those are two areas why uh, there might be increased investments. Okay, thank you. And before, yeah, we always get skeptical when we see that, that is often that, uh, and, and, and for me in, in, in the transportation background, it's always kind of the, uh, the urban dollars versus roads versus and highways versus public transportation. And I think that, that we see that again. So we have to pay attention in particular anytime they want to beef up something that it, it will probably adverse affect us. So I, I want to thank the panel for, for your testimony. It's been thorough. We have further questions that we'll, we'll uh, email and get out to you. Um, for the committee, and we we'll look forward to it, and certainly looking forward to being a, being a part of the hearing next week. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, her, and he's got a card, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the next panel will be uh, from Local 94, Cuba Brown. And Barbara Ingram from DC 37. John O'Malley from 1180. Jose Pinero from 32BJ. Could start to write. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. You can begin. Let me start on this end. Thank you. Good morning, committee uh, chair Miller and committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to testify here, be here, here today in support of these resolutions. My name is Jose Pinero, and I'm a member of 32 BA. I'm testifying here today on behalf of Kyle Bragg, secretary treasurer of 32 BA. Our union represents over 163,000 property service workers, including over 85,000 members here in New York City. 32 BA members are cleaners, janitors, security officers, window cleaners, airport workers, and all the building services workers. Our members' lives reflects the experience of tens of millions of Americans. We hear from 64 different countries and speak third, um, 28 different languages. But we all united by one belief that everyone who goes to work should be able to support their families and build a decent, healthy life. Collective bargaining has long been the instrument that has turned this belief into a reality 
for working people all across our country. By uniting their voices at the bargaining table, generations of Americans have won fair wages and benefits that allow them to enter the middle class. 32BJ is proud to be part of New York City strong labor tradition. For more than 80 years, we have thought we have fought for and won contracts for our members. They have raised industry standards by guaranteeing workers as a liable wage, health insurance for their families, and a chance to a secure retirement to qualify to quality pension, pension plans. Access to collective bargaining has recently opened the door to, to a better future for thousands of airport workers in New York City major transit hubs. Workers campaigning for three years to win the union on the job and contract that deliver job security, improved trainings, and safe work conditions. Law that undermine the ability of a worker to stand together and continually bargain service only to perpetuate the power imbalance that exists in our economy and denying working people a fair share of the prosperity they help to create. At this time of growing inequality, there is no more important measure that the government at all le levels can take than guarantee collective bargaining rights for all workers. On behalf of 32 BJ members, I applaud the, the Council for moving this resolution and urge all members to pass them with the strongest support. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Miller, committee members. My name is John O'Malley. I'm the legislative coordinator for CWA Local 1180, standing in for President Arthur Chiliotis. Uh, thank you um, for the opportunity to testify here today on behalf of our membership in support of the resolutions urging Congress to vote against proposed right to work and also affirming the right to collectively bargain for our workers in the city of New York. Labor unions are organized workers demanding democracy in our workplaces, in our communities, and in our nation. Workers organized in the unions serve as the equalizer against intimidation and exploitation by the rich and powerful. Organizing skills learned by union workers are easily applied to issues in the communities where they live, ensuring active civic participation. Most times, if there's a tenants, a homeowners, or a block association, a union activist helped to form it. The labor movement took children out of the mines and factories and put them in schools. Social Security, Civil Rights, Medicare came with the support and leadership of American labor. Unions raised wages, shortened hours, provide pensions and health benefits for their members and all Americans by setting standards all employers had to meet to attract good workers. Union members set these standards and became the backbone of the middle class. Today, labor union support campaigns such as the Fight for 15, Immigrants' Rights, Equal Pay for Women, LGBTQ Rights, and Medicare for All. The decline of the middle class in the last 30 years has shown us that when, when the 1% attack and wound labor unions, all American workers bleed. If anyone thinks labor unions are irrelevant today, then ask why greedy corporations are spending billions of dollars trying to destroy them. American workers suffered tough times, but they challenged unjust laws with industrial strife in a never-ending struggle for social and economic justice. They made an important breakthrough in the depths of the Depression when in 1935 Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act, which reads in the first section, it is declared to be the policy of the United States in order to eliminate the cause of certain substantial obstructions to the free flow of commerce and to mitigate the, the elimination of these obstructions when they've occurred, by encouraging the practice and procedure of collective bargaining and by protecting the exercise of workers of full freedom of association, self-organization, the designation of representatives of their own choosing for the purposes of negotiating the terms and conditions of their employment or for other mutual aid or protection. According to the NLRA, Lack of bargaining power by these workers prevents competitive wage rates and conditions within and between industries. The NLRA also lists some areas in which experience has proven how to safeguard 
the flow of commerce, and to promote the friendly adjustment of disagreements over wages and conditions, etc. According to the policy of the United States of America, the solution is to promote unions and collective bargaining. But that only covered workers in the private sector. It didn't, it didn't include farm workers, it didn't include government employees, and it didn't include railway and airlines. But in 1962, President Kennedy addressed this, at least for the federal public workers. His executive order numbers 10988 established that the United States of America, as the employer of thousands of federal workers in the public sector, recognized their right to organize into labor union and bargain collectively. Many of the same reasons cited by the NLRA for private employers were given as reasons that public employees should have the right to bargain collectively as well. That was 55 years ago, this past January. Also, 50 years ago is the anniversary of New York State's Taylor Law. This law finally gave public sector workers in the state of New York the right to join a union and bargain collectively. And it also promoted friendly adjustments of disputes by restricting the right to strike in exchange for a continuation of conditions while bargaining, mediation, fact-finding, and finally agreement. This is a progression of labor policy that has been the result of understanding that to promote the peaceful adjustment of disputes is better than allowing disagreements to turn into frustrations and finally strife. And these policies are also designed to balance the power between employee and employer, recognizing that the individual employee cannot possibly match the power of an employer without the ability to associate collectively. This concept is not unique to employment policy as we have other associations that are designed for the same collective purposes, tenants associations, community boards, etc. So today you will hear comparisons between states that have high density of union membership versus low density. These statistics are not in dispute, nor are they new to most of us. When unions are stronger, union workers have better wages, pensions, working conditions. But union wages and benefits set the standard for non-union workers as well. All employers must offer better wages, pensions, and working conditions. This has been a multiplier effect that allows more people to purchase goods and services, buy homes, pay rents, and pay more in taxes. Legislation is created to protect workers in the environment, and universal services are promoted. There's fewer strikes and less violence. Industries thrive. There's more workplace safety and fewer workers' compensation claims. Service to the customers or to the public is superior. The middle class is sustained and provides the economic engine to keep the economy going. In addition to that, having a strong union movement acts to level out many workplace issues of inequality. When you have a union, there's less racial inequality, less gender inequality, less inequality in all other forms. And having a strong union empowers people to seek out and achieve upward mobility. For example, our union supports our members with tuition assistance at the Murphy Institute of CUNY it is soon to be a School of Labor and Urban Studies of CUNY. You're also going to hear today about the devastating effects that might befall us if we weaken unions in New York City. These horror stories are also not in dispute. The results will likely begin with the weakening of a union structure and leadership. There will be less revenue coming in because people who benefit from the services will no longer be willing to pay for what they can get for free. And as money dries up, so do the benefits. There will be a reduction of services to the members, such as tuition assistance or direct representation or bargaining power. Our ability to research and hire experts to uncover the data needed to support our members will diminish. As we win fewer cases and achieve less in each contract, the downward spiral will begin. All the benefits I listed before will be lost. Wages will be diminished. People will not be able to live in the same neighborhoods or buy the same items. There will be shortcuts on safety. There will be discipline instead of training and unions will not be able to adjust the grievances in a peaceful way. Some may think that this would be a good thing, and maybe it will save a couple of dollars for a short term. But when the frustration level becomes untenable, it will likely manifest in worker explosion. And the depression of wages can be observed already in the 27 other states that have right-to-work laws already on the books. In New York, we have a rich history regarding the evolution of this policy and the laws that I mentioned earlier. The National Labor Relations Act is also known as the Wagner Act after its author, Senator Robert R. Wagner of New York. Jack Kennedy was obviously the brother to another U.S. Senator from New York. And George W. Taylor was the chair of the commission formed by Governor Nelson Rockefeller to enact such changes. <coughs> so we ask you today that you remain mindful of our ancestors when you decide to vote affirmatively to protect workers' rights in New York City, keeping the progress going, not halting it or rolling it back. 
There are two resolutions being considered today. The first establishes the right of New York City workers to collectively bargain. The other asks Congress to vote against any right to work legislation proposed. These are no-brainers. We have been fortunate in New York to have benefited from our strong constitutional protections of our public pensions and our right to education, health care, and many other items. We've also benefited from a long history of collective bargaining and all the benefits associated with it. And we're fortunate that New York has opted out of federal right to work provisions. That allows us to protect our workers and promote the sustainability of the middle class and upward mobility of our citizens. So please allow us to continue these practices despite the fact that another New Yorker who is in the White House does not support New York workers. Thank you to Chairman Miller and sponsors of the legislation for proposing these resolutions. Good morning, Chairperson Miller and members of the committee. For those who I have not met yet, my name is Cooper Brown, and I am the business manager of the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 94 and 94 A and B. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of more than 6,000 men and women I represent in IUA Local 94, as well as all working men and women, union and non-union alike. The members of our union operate the most sophisticated commercial and residential buildings in the world. We also operate power plants, work in hotel engine, as well as New York Public Schools. Through collective bargaining, we have guaranteed wages, vacation, and holidays, have a defined benefit pension plan, health insurance, and employee-funded training fund. In addition, our union has been able to create annuity fund and sick fund, as well as a college scholarship fund for our members. Just as important, our business agents are available to represent our members any time the dispute arises with management. We have been able to develop and grow these programs and provide representation because of dues our members pay to the union. Dues are the lifeblood of the organization labor. And right now, unions across the country are seeing the ability to collect dues disappear. Having it taken away by a devilishly named right to work law, the reality is they should rename theft of service law. Under right to work, members are free to refuse to pay dues, fair share, or agency fees, but not be denied any rights and protection enjoyed by all other union members. There are already 28 right to work states, the most recent added since 2011 when Wisconsin Scott Walker, with the support of his legislation, legislature, used a budget amendment to destroy the teachers and other public union employees. Even as we watch each of those states turn on the unions, we conceived ourselves, well, it can't happen in New York. I'm sure the union workers in Michigan, Indiana, and West Virginia, all one strong union states, thought the same thing until it happened and their union brothers and sisters in those states dropped paying dues. I admit, right to work would be very hard sell in New York. However, in November, the New York ballot will include a reprimand call for a constitutional convention. If approved, who knows if right to work or any anti-labor position will be discussed. What concerns me right now is the anti-labor forces backed by the Koch brothers are now pushing national right to work legislation in Congress. The bill now has more than 20 co-sponsors. If right to work becomes a law of the land, it will not only be the death knell for the unions, but the middle class. The <clears throat> numbers don't lie. Let's start in Wisconsin. According to University of Michigan studies since 2011, total teacher compensation in Wisconsin has dropped 8% or $6,500. According to the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics, the percentage of union members in the state dropped from 15.2% in 2009 to 8.1% in 2016. Nationally, 10.7% of the workforce, or 14.6 million workers, were represented by unions. By contrast, in 1983, when the BSL conducted its first count, 20.1% of the American workers, or 17.7 million men and women, were union workers. If anyone isn't convinced a union card matters, according to the same BLS report, weekly earnings for non-union workers was $802, or 80% of those in unions whose average weekly earnings were $1,004. Those are only the wage earners and do not include the health and welfare, pension, sick days, vacation, union representation, representation, and other benefits. So in November, families including many lifelong union families frustrated by having to work for low wages if they found work at all, voted Donald Trump who promised to fight for the American worker and make America great again. It may be great for billionaires in his cabinet and the Koch brothers, for the workers, not so much. Along with its right to work legislation, Congress has quietly voted to nullify two of President Obama's labor regulations, the Fair Pay and Safety Work Rule, 
which requires federal contractors and subcontractors to disclose any labor violation that occurred during the previous three years. And the OSHA regulations require employees to maintain accurate injury and illness records. While Trump promised a huge trillion dollar infrastructure program in recent days, he has made that plan contingent on health care and tax reform. He even talked about public-private partnerships and changes in the Davis-Bacon Act, which, ins which ensures workers on these projects to be paid the prevailing wage. He has also pointed out Neil Gorch to the Supreme Court will also certainly lead to a rehearing of Fredericks versus the California Teachers Association, which would permit public employees to stop paying union dues or agency fees. As we used to say when I was growing up in Brooklyn, talk is cheap. And what it is happening in Washington right now is putting the future of the middle class and this great country in jeopardy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Good morning, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. My name is Barbara Ingram Edmonds and I'm the Director of Field Operations for District Council 37. And I know you know us well and we're very pleased and happy to be here at this very important time with my fellow brothers here at the table on this important issue. As you know, we represent uh, the lion's share of uh, the civilian workforce in New York City and various agencies throughout uh, the city and some authorities as well. DC 37 is proud to support these two resolutions under consideration by your committee for the following reasons. This council is well aware of the litigation that is headed to the United States Supreme Court under the caption of Janus versus AFSCME, which repeats the arguments raised in the Friedrichs case, as you just heard from our brother. And it is important for us to be out ahead of this, um, not to get into too much detail, but one of the things I did want to point out is that currently members um, can get a dues rebate uh, once a year that's advanced to them for the position or the, the portion of the dues that pays for political and ideological issues, and that's something important to note. But as you know, the proponents of right to work favor that unions that are exclusive representatives provide all the benefits of collective bargaining, negotiations of contracts, administration of grievances, and representation in grievance proceedings for all workers in the unit whether or not all of them are contributing to the financial support of the union. Overall, DC 37 maintains that the exclusive representation of all workers in a bargaining unit does not violate the First Amendment and promotes labor peace, as you've already heard. Moreover, the collection of agency fee dues does not violate the First Amendment and it negates the risk of free riders. It also ensures that the union is able to meet its obligation to all members of the bargaining unit. That is, to be a strong advocate across the table in protecting those important benefits, wages, all the terms and conditions of employment that you've already heard about that ensure that we have the power that we need at the table uh, for a fair opportunity when we are workers covered by this collective bargaining laws that are currently in place. Without contributions from all covered employees, unions are not able to meet all these obligations under the law. And basically what the right to work laws, if they were passed affecting our state, would destroy our unions, um, would basically kill the financial core that gives us the ability to represent all at the bargaining table or when it comes to grievances and other forms of representation and disciplinary action. We also support the right of states and municipalities to bargain with exclusive representation of their employees. For this creates labor peace, it promotes workforce management and productivity, and as you've already heard from the speakers, it ensures the addressing of the inequalities that are particularly faced in our communities in terms of working people and communities of color. Unions provide and do that bridge as well for women in terms of having that ability to have a decent, fair contract and working conditions. So I will end with this, that we appreciate the time that you provided us with uh, to share uh, our concerns and to support this important resolutions. And we hope that uh, whatever you do on your part will help ensure that harmonious labor relations between labor and management, protecting working people, the labor unions, and the workplaces and communities and families throughout New York City prevail 
with the work that you're doing through your committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you to you all. And I, I don't usually do this, but I, I, I'm going to take a privilege to, to really thank you for your thoughtful and insightful testimony that you brought here today. It will all be posted because um, the world needs to see uh, how we become the town that we are, why we fight to, to maintain our position as a strong labor town, and um, what the impact, certainly what the impact on this administration would be. And I think that you guys have, have, have really covered it and articulated uh, uh, the needs uh, to continue to fight and move forward uh, quite well in, in, in detail in, in every way. So, um, and you haven't left much, but I do have some questions that were already written out and that the team put together. So I, I want you to be able to address those as well. But, and, and these are for anyone, if, 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 if it happens to be a specific question I will ask, but um, just in general, um, how will we characterize the first 100 days of this administration from a, a labor perspective? Anyone? Well, for our union, uh, District Council 37 asked me, and I would say that along with the coalition of many of the other unions, both in the city that we've been working with, as well as the state, we've been deeply concerned and we've expressed our concerns both through lobbying against uh, the Supreme Court, now Associate Justice Gorsuch, as well as the successful efforts we had in ensuring that the initial push for the labor secretary nominee did not occur. We're still deeply concerned and we will continue to fight vigorously against any anti-worker, anti-community, anti-immigrant, um, anti-worker or <coughs> community of color actions by this administration and we feel that based on the executive orders from overtime to many other actions that they've taken that we are going to have to continue to be uh, in the forefront, not only working with unions, but also working with our community partners and other individuals and states and city municipalities like you all uh, to ensure that he does not, the Trump administration does not continue to erode the critical benefits. So we have not seen very positive things coming out of the administration, but we are continuing to fight and will continue to do that on behalf of our members and the communities we serve. I think it all comes down to education. I've been on a 12-year educational program with my members, educating them on all the devastation coming to the labor movement. I think our politicians in our city, in our state, have to be educated too. So a young generation that hasn't lived through it. I've been around for 40 plus years. I'm 66 years old. I seen unions in its heyday when they were great. Right after World War II, my grandfather, my father, and how everybody benefited from the union, even the non-union guy. The non-union guy benefited because the corporations that didn't want to enter their door paid him more, gave him free medical and free pension plan. And at the same time, they were devising a way to get rid of us and shame on us for being not wise enough to see them coming after us. They took each one of us and denegotiated with us separately. So we broke away from all the calf grills, all the groups that we had when we struck together and did the country and did the right thing. The most powerful union in this country one day was the Teamsters. Mr. Hoffa, as much as everybody puts him down, he controlled this country better than the President of the United States. He could shut both coasts down and both borders, Canada and the United States, and he took care of his membership, and he was there for the working men, and everybody benefited for it. If you really want to go into history, learn about the Kennedy administration. As wonderful they were, they're the ones who started the 5% outsourcing the work in this country with the International Lady Garment Workers Union. If you remember, after World War II, they were the largest employer in New York City at the time. Over the years, 5% of the work went out. What do we have here today? 3%? And every major corporation did the same thing, started outsourcing working. So what are left of the viable jobs in this country today? union jobs. And as much as we have diminished, we still maintain our employees. But look at the rest of the population. What do they get? Go work in McDonald's, Burger King? If everybody's not educated and realize the devastation that's coming to this country and right to work 
killing the middle class. There is no middle class anymore in this country. We had a middle class. Everybody and everybody must be educated and understand. I believe in right to work. But I want viable jobs and viable benefits for people. I want to see people be able to retire at 65, not to work till they die. We're turning this country into, we used to be, slavery again. Indentured slavery. Working for the big masses. Didn't we have a revolutionary war to kick Jean, King George out of our country? Well, now we have corporate America. Does anybody realize there is no difference what corporate America is doing to this country? I'm sorry. You got me going. You know when I get going, it's a very hot item with me. But at the end of the day, education is the thing. I don't believe our politicians, your constituents, are my members. Once I disappear, how much longer do you think they're going to have what they have? Five years? Six years? And what about our children and future generations? We have to work together. You have to protect your constituents. I have to protect my members. And if we do it jointly and work together and get everybody on the same page, maybe we can bring back a middle class in this country. Maybe we can make it great, because that man in D.C. is not going to make it great. Sorry once again for blowing off some hot steam. You asked for it, though. <laughs> um. The first uh, 100 days of the administration seems to be characterized by um, some devastating appointments to critical positions, some uh, removals of, uh, of old and existing and longstanding um, positive policies, and also some establishment of some pretty scary stuff. Uh, but compared to the 100 days preceding that during uh, the candidate's time period, I think there's a stark difference between what was being talked about then, the populist message, the protection of the working man and so forth. And now you look at all of the policies and all the people that, that he's put into place is the exact opposite. But none of it has really yet um, come to fruition. And so I think a more important question is, what's going to happen in the next 100 days? Because now that all of these people and policies are in place, now he can actually start putting his plan into action. And it's going to be our job not just as labor and not just as government, but, but to break down the silos that are between all of us and really to create a movement to try to fight this and make sure that we fight off all of these advances uh, in the wrong direction. We have seen in this administration that uh, they've put in together a team that uh, determined to uh, destroy the, the rights uh, of the workers and the unions. And this troubled time, it should give us uh, a wake up where all unions should stand together and work together to send a powerful message. Because if we work and we fight separately, it will be a bloody, a bloody, it will be a, a harder work fight. So, um, Besides wages and benefits and, and, and other victories that we've seen and, and been able to negotiate through collective bargaining, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I know Ms. Ingram uh, mentioned some of, some of the things uh, around uh, protecting rights to uh, fair hearings and in, in, in areas of discipline and so forth. What, uh, what potential laws are, and rights are workers looking at other than the obvious that we're seeing here, because often I know union members only see what they see in their paycheck and not the things that protect the day to day. Um, and, and, and those are the things I think that, would, as you said, that, that the impact on, um, on um, organized communities have on those communities around them and raising up standards, uh, labor standards around them, but the, all of those labor standards don't always follow beyond wages and, and sometimes benefits, and as we talked about, uh, discipline policies and, and so forth like that. What are we, uh, some of the things that we can, uh, that we see that concern us coming out of Washington, D.C. these days? Uh, one thing that comes immediately to mind is something that was mentioned earlier today, and that is the fiduciary rule that came out uh, under the Obama administration several months ago. 
And it's important to note that the fiduciary rule came out as a, as a rule from the Labor Department, but it came after well over a decade of study after study after study, revealing that um, when, when a person takes their life savings or even just some money that they have from selling a house or something like that and goes to a financial advisor, the financial advisor does not advise you uh, based upon what your needs are. They advise you based upon what their needs are. And um, it's sort of a, a wonky discussion to get into, but the best way that I can describe it is there's a big difference between going to somebody and asking them what's the best type of food I should eat for the nutrition for my body, or do you go to the butcher and say, hey, what do you think the best kind of food is that I should eat? Because the butcher who's selling you the meat is going to say, you should eat lots more meat. And that's what had been going on over and over and over again. The great thing is that after all of the intellectual studies were done and the academic studies were done, we came out with a rule that protected the public, not just union members, not just people in the city, not just people in New York State, but it protected all people. And, and now the Trump administration has undone that rule based upon you know, the, you know, uh, in the uh, private interests of certain people that influenced him. So these are the kind of things that, that unions certainly take the lead on but doesn't just protect them, it protects everyone. Uh, there are a lot of other examples like protecting universal service for internet. There's things like protecting uh, the needs of uninsured people or people on Medicaid to have health insurance. I mean, unions are often the leaders or the co-leaders in some of those things, but they're not necessarily things that only benefit union members. They're, they are things that benefit the public in general. If you take into consideration Obama's administration with the fair pay and workplace safety, that's a, that protected everybody. Even with prevailing wage laws, whether you were union or non-union, at least you got a decent wage. You may not got the benefits, but you had it. Right now, with every strike of his pen, he's not only decimating unions, he's decimating decent jobs for middle class people. We have to get out there, like I said, I'm repeating myself and I shouldn't have to, Everybody has to get educated. There's not enough in the press. There's not enough we're doing with my members and your constituents. We have to get the message to explain to them, what are you losing? We all voted for him because he was going to make it better. It hasn't been better in his first 100 days. How much are we losing? How much protection is the citizen in this country losing? What's being taken away from you? Less money, less pay, less benefits. And the guy on top keeps getting richer and richer. Not getting out there. Not getting out there, big problem. Again, I, I, I want to thank this panel for all the information that they've brought forth. There's a plethora and wealth of information that has been provided, and I'm going to make sure that this gets out, gets posted, and gets to my colleagues and others um, who really need to, to, to read this information and, and uh, to join this coalition. Uh, that protects and stands for working families here in the city. So I, I thank you for your testimony and look forward to working, continuing to work with you in the future. Thank you. And our final panel was uh, Ms. Marnie Von Wilpark from the Economic Policy Institute and Ruth Milman from, Milkman from the Murphy Institute. Okay. Yep, you can begin. Either way. No, it doesn't matter. Pick one. Flip a coin. Um, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm Ruth Melkman from the City University of New York Graduate Center and the Murphy Institute. Um, a lot of what I have to say has already been touched on in the earlier testimony, but I'll, so I'll try to be brief, and you have the written testimony. I, I just want to start by pointing out that 
we don't really know yet the full implications of the election of Donald Trump and equally important of the current composition of the U.S. Congress for organized labor. But there certainly are, as you've already heard, a lot of indications that the hard-won gains of the U.S. labor movement are under threat to an unprecedented degree. And I think, you know, that prospect is particularly important here in New York City because we are the nation's most highly unionized city. Um, I handed out copies of this report that some of you have seen before, um, which documents this in much more detail, but I'll just hit a couple highlights. Um, the most recent data we have show that over a quarter of all wage and salary workers living in New York City's five boroughs were union members, and that's actually increased from about 22% in 2012. It's more than double the national average. So we have a lot to lose here. Um, in contrast to the national trend of steady decline in private sector union density, union density just means the share of all employed workers who are union members, here in New York, in the private sector, union density has actually risen somewhat since the Great Recession. Um, and private sector union density here in the city is about 19 percent, which is three times the national level. The public sector unionization rate here is also exceptionally high. For the city, it was 71 percent in the most recent data, which is double the national rate. Um, so, as you know, the potential threats to unions now emanating from Washington include a proposed national right to work law, which would amend the 1935 Wagner Act or the National Labor Relations Act, as it's officially known, to prohibit the union shop, in which all workers in a bargaining unit must join the union after being hired. That would be a national prohibition, not just in individual states, as is the case already. Um, the prospects of passage for that proposed amendment are far from certain, however. What is far more likely is that the National Labor Relations Board, which administers the act, will have a conservative majority by the end of this year when three of its five members will be Trump appointees, and that will likely lead to rulings far more hostile to union rights than those we've seen in the last eight years. Um, even more certain is that, this has already been discussed a little bit, is that the recent appointment of Judge Gorsuch to the Supreme Court will lead to a major decision affecting public sector unions across the nation. What I consider the timely death of Antonin Scalia led to a su split Supreme Court decision in the Friedrichs case, as you know, but virtually everybody expects a different outcome on this issue now that there's a conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Um, a series of cases are wending their way forward with the same basic thrust as Friedrichs, the most likely of which to come up soon is Janus versus AFSCME, which is a case brought by a group of Illinois public employees and litigated by none other than the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Um, Janus, like Friedrichs, poses a direct threat to public sector unions here in New York and around the nation. Um, as you know, current law allows public sector unions to collect agency fees from non-members who are covered by collective bargaining agreements, and those fees are intended to cover the costs of union representation, as some of the previous speakers very eloquently explained. Um, as is widely, it's widely expected that Janus will be decided in favor of the plaintiffs, that is, against the unions, and that agency fees will be prohibited by U.S. law. So it's hard to predict the effects of this, but I did look up a number of data that I think are interesting in this regard. We can determine the current number of agency fee payers in key unions here in the city from public records. So here are a few examples from New York City's public sector unions. DC 37 has 19,400 agency fee payers, according to the most recent report that was filed with the federal government. That, that's 16.5 percent of the bargaining unit. In the Transit Workers Local 100, there are about 5,000 agency fee payers, or 11, well, actually, sorry, 12 percent of the total membership. In my own union, PSC CUNY, there are 3,600 agency fee payers, 14 percent of the membership. So if the predictions are correct that Janus will be decided um, in such a way as to prohibit agency fees, not only will these workers' fees be eliminated to union resources, but in addition, an unknown number of current members may no longer be members once they learn that they're not obliged to pay anything for union representation. And here I think we can learn from what happened in Wisconsin, where, as you know, under Scott Walker, state legislation restricting public sector collective bargaining was passed in 2011. And in Wisconsin, public sector union density has fallen from 50 percent in 2011 before this law took effect 
to 23% today. In other words, it's been cut by more than half. So there are other issues as well. Republicans in Congress have already introduced bills that would make it easier to fire workers with union sympathies. They've introduced bills to repeal the Davis-Bacon Act, which requires prevailing wages for federally funded construction projects. And in addition, as I'm sure you're very aware, a variety of new threats to immigrant workers who make up almost half of the city's workforce are looming. And the proposed cuts to the U.S. Department of Labor's budget proposed by the Trump administration threaten to weaken federal enforcement of existing wage and hour laws, enforcement that was strengthened significantly under the previous administration. So in short, New York City and its labor movement have a great deal at stake in this new political era, and I, um, Glad to see these resolutions that you all are considering, and I hope the committee will continue to monitor these developments and take appropriate actions. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Miller. Thank you for having me. My name is Marnie Von Wilpert. I'm a labor law attorney at the Economic Policy Institute in D.C. Uh, at EPI, we are committed to watching the federal government, Congress, the White House, the federal agencies, to assess policies that are coming out that affect workers and, em and employee rights to see what their impact is going to be on a fair economy. And we've built a website so far that is tracking all of the executive orders, the presidential memoranda, uh, all the bills that were dropped that my colleague discussed, and how they're going to impact the fair economy because there is so much coming at us, it's been hard to track it all. So that's on EPI's website. Um, I have prepared testimony, which I've submitted, but most of it's been discussed, so I want to just add things that I think could be helpful. Um, as we know, the right to work law was introduced in Congress. It has 22 sponsors in the Senate, um, which is about half the Senate, although it's not clear whether it would pass, and 20 sponsors in the House. We're up to 28 states now who have right to work laws. Missouri was the, the 28th as of February. As we all know, uh, right to work is misleadingly named. It actually doesn't create rights for employees. It takes away their rights to democratically decide in their workplaces how they're going to assert their rights. We've seen what President Trump has said, but we are also trying to shine a light on what he has done. So that's the most worrying aspect of the presidential administration to me is what's going on in, in the dark behind closed doors. President Trump has said publicly that he wants to create American jobs by revitalizing America's infrastructure. But then he quietly signs legislation eviscerating the Fair Pay Safe Workplaces Act, or rule, and the OSHA record keeping rule, which is a big deal, especially here in New York City with all the deaths on construction sites, in, especially in non-unionized workforces. So the federal attack on unions will also jeopardize the safety of New York's workers because it will not allow unionized workforces to increase the safety programs. Trump also says publicly that construction workers are the backbone of America, yet he quietly authorized the Department of Labor to delay implementation of the silica exposure rule for construction workers. That rule would have protected two million of those very construction workers from lung cancer causing silica dust exposure. There's no need to delay it. When the rule was first um, finally implemented back in 2016, it had a one-year grace period built in, allowing employers a full year to adopt the simple wetting down systems or vacuum systems that they would have had to adopt. Why do we need extra time when they already had a year grace period? But that's what he's done. Finally, Trump says publicly that he wants to fight for workers who have been left behind in our economy, yet he quietly installs people in the Department of Labor like Jeffrey Buck, who has spent his entire career trying to bring down prevailing wage laws like David ba Davis Bacon. So is he really standing up for workers or is he trying to cut their wages? At EPI, we are trying to shine a light on what he does, and we are glad to be here to support the City Council, who is also shining a spotlight on him, and we support the resolutions to allow New York workers to, elect, to collectively bargain and against the right to work laws, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you so much. Um, so while, while I have you here, and I know this has been answered, but uh, if you had to assess the intent based on what we've seen in the first 100 days, and, and this is different from the, the but the intent, wh wh where are they going with this? Um, you know, I agree with my colleague here that a lot of the tweets and rhetoric that come out of the White House are kind of a curtain behind which 
a much more systematic approach to eviscerating the historically established rights of working people are being attacked. So it's very hard to detect intent because it's not publicly visible, right? Instead, we see this sort of set of antics that distract everybody from what's actually happening. Um, but there's a lot of very um, clear signs that uh, bad things are going to come out of this administration. And not just the administration, but also the Republican Congress, um, which has its own, you know, they're not all exactly the same, but it has its own um, agenda, very hostile to organized labor and to working people, regardless of whether they're union members or not, as we've already heard. I would characterize the intent as fraud on workers. Um, on, there are a lot of problems in our economy that have left a lot of workers behind, and we have to address them. President Trump and the Republicans in Congress are trying to capitalize on the need for workers to have jobs, to have security in their retirement, uh, and they're perpetrating fraud on them. So while he talks about every worker needs a right to safe, uh, safe workplace and fair pay, like you said, he eviscerates the uh, uh, fiduciary rule, which is still in play. It's a 60-day delay. We'll see what happens. Um, there, all of the bills coming into Congress have these names from Republicans, such as the Working Families Flexibility Act, which is sponsored um, by Senator Roby, and it's a way to make sure that employers don't actually have to pay your overtime. But again, it's a fraud on workers. It's, it's pitched as worker flexibility. Same thing with the Davis-Bacon Repeal Act. It says, oh, we're going to cut down government, costly government budgets so that we can push through more transportation and infrastructure spending. But that's a fraud on workers again because it's going to cut budgets, not by cutting money out of the big managers and companies and contractors, but by taking money out of employees' pockets. All of these bills, right to work, are named in a way that it seems that they're good for workers, but in the end they're not. So that's why I characterize it as fraud. I know that uh, you've written extensively on women in the workplace. On what? Women on women in, in the, the workplace. workplace. Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you know that you, you have written on women in the workplace, right? So that, that's correct, right? So, yes. Okay. Um, could you elaborate on the impact that, that some of the policy that has come out of D.C. so far would have on women in the workplace? All right, well, there are a couple of different things I'll just mention. One is that um, many of us were expecting, if the election had come out differently than it did, that um, the Family Act, which would provide a national paid family leave program for the first time in the United States, um, catching us up to the rest of the world, I might add, um, would have become law. It's actually one of the main sponsors of it is our Senator Kristen Gillibrand. That has virtually no prospect of happening right now um, because of the outcome of the election. So that's one thing. Um, that makes an enormous difference or could, could have made an enormous difference to working families. Um, the other thing I'll just mention is that insofar as the attacks on organized labor are successful, that actually hurts women who are now almost half of the nation's unionized workers. Um, that gender gap between uh, non-union and union workers has, I'm sorry, between women and men in the organized labor um, ranks has actually closed. And then what that reflects is the strength of public sector unionism, which, which is a sector that employs vast numbers of women. So if um, Janus has the effects I was predicting earlier, um, it's women and I might add people of color who will be disproportionately impacted. Thank you. And, and um, Ms. Vaughn Wilper, um, could you speak specifically about some of the work that your organization has been doing in, in, in uh, highlighting the uh, Perkins Project as well? Yes, sir. So we named the Perkins Project after Francis Perkins, who was a Secretary of Labor under uh, FDR. And what we... Another New Yorker. Another New Yorker, <laughs> yes. And um, what we're doing is we're a policy response team. So I'm one of two labor lawyers who was recently brought on to EPI to try and build our economic analysis and our policy research together. So um, that's what we're doing. That's why we built the website that's tagging everything that's coming out of Congress so we can keep track of it. So that when it's time to hold our politicians accountable, come 2018, come 2020, we have their track records built. 
So I also came from the National Labor Relations Board, which is where I was practicing before I came to EPI. And I wanted to highlight something else for Washington that's going to affect women and everyone in this country. But the Supreme Court will be hearing next term a case called Murphy Oil versus the National Labor Relations Board. And this is about forced arbitration and employment. The, the NLRB a couple years ago decided that it is against the National Labor Relations Act to require employees as a condition of employment to sign away their rights to go to court in collective action because that is a form of collective action in your workplace. So the Supreme Court has taken it up. John Roberts took it up during when Aaliyah was, uh, um, Scalia was on the court. And then when Scalia died, we got an order saying we're actually going to kick this case to the next term. So it could have been heard right now, but he didn't want only an eight justice court, which means we know which way he is leaning. So that's going to be heard in the fall of 2017. Had that case been gone the way we wanted it to, it would have meant that forced arbitration would be off the table for employment. And all of the women at Fox News, for example, who want to sue their employers in open court would have had a chance to. That's likely gonna be gone. Same thing with um, uh, huge uh, employment discrimination cases are going to come before the Supreme Court. As we know, the Seventh Circuit recently decided that sexual orientation discrimination is part of Title VII. That's going to come before the Supreme Court as well, and we are quite worried about how Gorsuch is going to vote on that. So other things with the NLRB, and cut me off if I'm talking too much. Um, we are, the joint employer standard is one of the things that I found most compelling about working at the NLRB in the last few years. And that is because our economy has shifted so much to temporary workers and contingent workers. But they get hired by the temp companies to go work at a plant, and then when they form a union, the plant owner says, oh, well, we're not your employer. We can't bargain with you. But we're the ones telling you how to operate the plant, how to put on the safety equipment, your hours of work. Uh, and so they're, they're caught between the, a rock and a hard place. And so the NLRB finally said, listen, if both y'all are gonna hire these workers, you're both gonna bargain with the union. That currently is in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. We're awaiting for a decision any day. But like my colleague said, we have three openings on the board. And so if that switches back to a Republican majority, that could be gone. So we, we have a, a lot of work to do. Obviously we can't lobby for those members, uh, those appointees to, to, to the board there. I mean, we would be lobbying you know, I think that would be an exercise futility, but what could we do to kind of ensure that we have the type of balance that we've, uh, and, and I know it's taken years coming out of the past uh, administrations to kind of balance out the, the board and to see come some of the decisions that we've been able to see over the past few years. And I'm gonna leave you there. I just have a question. This is one of my pet peeves and one of the conversations that I always bring up when we talk about organized labor, and that is the proliferation of the non-union uh, right to work workforce in the deep south in the auto industry. Mm -hmm. Has there been any particular studies, reports, or have we taken any special looks at that uh, from earnings, safeties perspective? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I'm not familiar with any. I don't know. I'm, I'm not aware of any new studies on that, but the really alarming thing is that Michigan now has a right to work law too. It's not just the South anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna affect workers in many industries, including autos all over the country. So, so um, I, I know that there's the obvious disparity in wages. Um, I think I read a, a New York Times piece a uh -huh. few months back, which really talked about safety not only in the manufacturers that, that are in those deep south states of Alabama, Mississippi, and, and so forth, um, but also the manufacturers that provide parts there mm -hmm. um, were, were just were brutal, were absolutely brutal. Um, they had men and women uh, working on lines who had not been trained, that had bought, lost limbs, um, there was no process, uh, obviously that was, workers comp involved and all kinds of other things. And it was just a horrendous, horrendous um, experience for those workers there. And, and certainly um, even, the union still exists in, 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 in UAW, in, in Michigan. Yes. And, and so there's still some, so some protections for now. 
I can just add a little bit of information to this, which is that the plants in the South that are non-union are all um, owned by companies based in other countries like BMW and so on. The U.S. manufacturing assembly plants in the auto industry are all unionized. Mm -hmm. However, that is not true in the parts industry. That's where the UAW has really lost ground. I don't know the latest figures, but it's less than half of the parts workers are unionized all over the country, not just in the South. So that's where you see the real abuses. And I think more generally we know that especially with the cutbacks that are coming in labor law enforcement from the government, and that's not just at the federal level, sadly, but many other places, not here, I guess, so, but so that, you know, that, that unions are the main watchdog for this stuff. And so insofar as they're weakened, you're going to see more and more of that. And, and I often raise that question because often it's being touted that they're bringing these jobs to these locations. And if you look at what the jobs have been and what they potentially can be, what they have created is really a race to the bottom and, and such a low standard amongst, amongst workers um, in those industries there. And so I, I think it's something that we probably should take, uh, pay more attention to as kind of a, a microcosm of what can be um, if in fact uh, we lose our right to collective bargaining and some of the labor standards that are being diminished. Um, I think that is precisely what we will get, and, and that's why I raised that question. Mm -hmm. So I, I love, I, thank you so much for, for, for your testimony. Again, all of this really relevant uh, and insightful testimony will be posted uh, for, for the world to see. Uh, and um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today, uh, giving the testimony uh, from, from the unions, obviously our advocates and this distinguished professors. Uh, and um, policy people and um, the administration. I'd like to thank all the uh, union folks that have come out as well. And those to those watching that uh, you could watch this again at uh, NewYorkCityCouncil.gov oh, okay. and uh, dissect it. And we'll, this information will also be posted on, on our site. So tweet at us. Uh, I, I, Danique Miller. And uh, we will certainly get back and love to finish this conversation. Look forward to working with everyone. With that, we, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.